Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A woman charged with a DWI crash that killed a retired Converse assistant police chief was sentenced in court today. Jean Nicole Kutros was given 10 years in a plea deal. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom as Rodney Rex Reiner's family and friends face Kutros in court. You took away my best friend. A letter written by Rodney Rex Reiner's wife, Linda, was read in court by her son, John Reiner. The letter described Rex's life as a family man, his career in law enforcement, and years of giving back to the community. All of it directed at Jean Nicole Kutros. On March 10, 2020, Kutros was seen driving erratically on Nacogdoches Road. An SAPD officer tried pulling her over, but she evaded arrest and went into oncoming traffic hitting the vehicle Rex was in. Who chose breaking down during victim impact statement as Rex's daughter-in-law discussed having to tell her daughter that her grandpa had passed away. And now the seven-year-old child has something to say. At seven years old, wants you to know that you broke her heart and that her heart breaks every day because she doesn't get to be, because he doesn't get to be here with her anymore. Others to speak included former Converse Police Chief Rick Jamison and Converse Mayor Al Suarez. Today is all about accountability, about your accountability for your actions, your choices. This was no accident, this was choices. My hope is that you serve the entire maximum time. The evading arrest charge was waived as a part of the plea deal, so it was just 10 year sentence for the intoxication manslaughter charge. She will have to serve half before she's eligible for parole. At the Kidden Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A man in custody tonight after an hours long standoff with officers on I-35. It all started around two o'clock last night or early this morning on I-35 near Bamsey and Ritterman Road. SAPD says that man stopped in the middle of the lane and then made threats to officers. Police aren't sure if he was armed. At some point, the man told officers he just wanted to be left alone. SAPD says the standoff ended peacefully sometime around 6 o'clock this morning. The interstate was shut down for several hours because of all of this. The man has not been identified. San Antonio police left with some questions to answer after a teenager was shot in the leg overnight. Officers say that call came in just after midnight to the Costa Valencia apartments off of Old Highway 90. According to police, the teen said that he was shot after being robbed by two men, but a crime scene could not be found. That teen is expected to recover. Time is ticking down for early voting before polls are closed until Election Day this Saturday. City Council races, bonds, school board members and ballot propositions all up on May 6th. Garrett Berger tells us how the last day of early voting is winding down. Hey, Garrett. <laughs> Voters here at Lions Field uh, up uh, on Broadway all lined up as well, trying to get in in the final hours of early voting. And while we haven't talked to them or we don't know everybody's mind, it's likely that there's one issue in particular drawing many of those San Antonio city voters. Political consultant Laura Barbarena says San Antonio voter turnout appears to be on par with other years, but there are more Republican voters in the mix that more vote Republican voters in the mix than is normal. Unsurprisingly, Surprisingly, she believes the controversial Proposition A, which aims to decriminalize marijuana and abortion and expand the city's site and release program, is helping to bring out those voters. Supporters and opponents alike are pouring money into campaigns on both sides, though the anti-Prop A side may, is making up most of that, especially the police union's PAC, Protect SA, which has spent nearly as much as every other campaign in the election combined. So we see that is definitely a factor in this election, uh, which also we, I feel is leading to why it's a little bit more of a conservative um, leaning uh, or conservative leaning electorate at this point. We have more information on the election on our website, ksat.com. The QR code you see on your screen should lead you right to the section you need so you can make yourself an informed decision at the ballot box. Now, polls close today at 8 p.m., but they will reopen on Saturday, May 6th, Election Day itself. Live at Lions Field, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Garrett. Just one of many school bonds on the ballot this election is in Comal ISD, roughly $634 million worth. The district spans 589 square miles. They add about 1,000 students each year. Here's what's in that Comal ISD bond package. 
Proposition A is the big one, north of $560 million. That money would go toward building three new elementary schools and a new middle school, plus beefing up safety and security. Just a few of the highlights include things like a video surveillance system, intrusion detection upgrades, and creating a district-wide emergency operations center. What this bond package is going to do is going to allow us to really unify our systems. So to make sure that all of our systems speak to each other, our camera systems, our access control systems. We're going to be installing uh, sensors on all our exterior doors. Prop A also includes improvements to things like heat and air conditioning, paving, drainage, and upgrades to several athletic facilities. Prop B is worth roughly $46 million. It would pay for improvements to the Davenport High School Field House and the Canyon Lake High School Stadium including adding more than one exit. Several years ago, we had a lightning uh, delay, and so we had to evacuate that stadium. Uh, and it took over an hour to get everybody out of those bleachers. Then Prop C, $28 million for student technology and infrastructure. Part of that includes outdoor Wi-Fi, which the district says is a safety issue. If our first responders have access to our network, they have access to our camera systems, they have access to, um, again, our safety and security systems where they can access floor plans, they can see where shutoffs are located. So it really helps them in, in, in a situation where they need to respond to a situation on campus. Comal ISD says if approved by voters, this bond package would not increase property taxes. Now, if you have already voted or perhaps looked at a sample ballot, that part might sound confusing because the last line of each bond proposal on the ballot says it is a property tax increase. But that doesn't mean you'll actually pay more in property taxes. That wording is required by state law, but there's two parts to a school district tax rate that you pay. Both parts fluctuate. It's all broken down here. Take a look at this QR code, scan it to find out more. How school bonds are paid for, that's the focus of this week's KSAT Explains. We aired it right here yesterday. You can check it out anytime. Around Texas tonight, the search continues for the suspected mass shooter out of uh, Cleveland, Texas. That search now in its fourth day, and authorities still have no leads on the whereabouts of Francisco or Preza. Hundreds of law enforcement officers are now going door to door looking for him. He is accused of killing five of his neighbors with an AR-15 Friday night. The youngest victim killed just nine years old. The Biden administration is preparing for the end of Title 42 next week. The military plans to send 1,500 active duty troops to the southern border ahead of that policy expiring. Title 42 has allowed authorities to turn away certain migrants at the border. White House officials say the troops will be there to support the Department of Homeland Security for 90 days. They will serve in administrative roles and are not supposed to do any law enforcement work. The 988 Suicide Prevention Lifeline was rolled out just about a year ago, and calls to that number have skyrocketed. While that is a huge win, it means more funding is now needed for expansion. As Mental Health Awareness Month begins, Courtney Friedman spoke with a San Antonio man who helped take that issue to all the way to the Texas legislature. I lost my dad to suicide in 2010. I kind of fell into my own suicidal ideations and self-medication and things like that. Greg Watson overcame those dark times and turned them into purpose. He now sits on the board of San Antonio's chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Being able to bring that to light to the people that can actually make a huge difference. People like state lawmakers. Watson was one of 35 advocates who met with 60 state legislators in Austin last month to push for a couple bills. One bill would support the 988 suicide lifeline that was established last year, which since has been flooded with calls. The bill would increase the number of centers answering those calls. San Antonio doesn't even have one right now, right? As a major metropolitan area. So if you dial 988 from here in San Antonio, you'll likely actually be connected to someone in Houston or in Austin. They, of course, can offer you the local resources, but this funding could expand the infrastructure right here in San Antonio. The bill is set and requesting a sort of advisory committee to help establish that infrastructure and kind of develop a certain level of standards as far as the overall service itself. The committee would tackle how callers are connected to help. The system will connect me with somebody based on my area code rather than whatever cell phone tower that I'm connected to locally. People are being connected to help centers according to their area code, which sometimes is not where they live. We were meeting with Republicans, Democrats mm -hmm. and the like 
like, um, and everybody was very receptive. Watson keeps his dad in mind as he plans to keep pushing for change. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And coming up tomorrow at 6 o'clock, we dive into the other bill. Watson and his team have brought to the attention of lawmakers. It has to do with what's called mental health first aid. If you or someone you know is struggling, call 988 or you can reach out to AFSP or NAMI. A brand new center aims to link all five San Antonio missions and serve as a starting point to that experience that also encompasses Europe. Father Carlos Velasquez, he's the rector of San Fernando Cathedral, says there's been an increase in people coming to visit the missions. He says 1.3 million people toured them last year, but there's not a focal point of where tourists can really gather. He says that's why the Archdiocese of San Antonio created this center, El Camino de San Antonio Missions Pilgrimage Center, and it celebrated its grand opening today. But now, not only do we have that actual mission trail, but we have a center where they can come and take it all in. And we know that pilgrimages, they change lives, they change hearts. That's what we want. El Camino de San Antonio Missions is in partnership with Spain's El Camino de Santiago de Compostela. Pilgrims can receive credit toward both routes on their pilgrim passport, obtaining stamps from each mission church and the cathedral. Take a look outside with live cam right now. We got some big puffy clouds out there. We talked yesterday about all the rain we've gotten lately. We have some more on the way, Adam. Yeah, we do. And today it looks like it could rain at any moment. We just had a few sprinkles pop up on the radar and that was it. And then the clouds broke up later this afternoon, which pushed us up to 80 for the high temperature. That's three degrees below average, but our morning low was five degrees above average. As for temperatures elsewhere, highs today, 73 in Uvalde, 75 in Rock Spring, 79 in Kerrville. You can tell where the clouds really held tight for longer, and that was in parts of the hill country and out west. And now even a shadow of clouds passing overhead Del Rio. This is the blow off cloud cover from thunderstorms off to the west in Mexico and parts of West Texas. They're going to have a hard time making it to the border. We're going to talk about our storm chances and when they return in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Let's take a look at uh, your Tuesday evening commute here. Loop 1604 Northwest Military. A little slow going there as those two lines of traffic come together. Still ahead here on the news at 6, trash around a spot of park is piling up after heavy recent rains. What the San Antonio River Authority plans to do to keep the trash out of the water. Next. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. Who's killing cows in Bear County? It's a question that multiple animal rights agencies are asking, and tonight we hear from a local cattle owner who explains why the loss is so devastating. And you don't want to miss our latest episode of Fighting Fentanyl. It's about hope, a program at UT Health San Antonio received a big grant to help people suffering from addiction, and tonight... You're going to learn how that money is going to help people suffering from opioid addiction. Those stories and a lot more for you tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephania. Trash troubles along the San Antonio River. A viewer recently shared some photos with us of trash at a spot of park after heavy rains. Yeah, it is nasty. Mm -hmm. RJ Mark has stopped by the park to check it out and also spoke to the River Authority about what they're trying to do to keep the water clean. These are photos from KSAP viewer Kaylin Gonzalez, showing plastic bottles and piles of trash at Espada Park over the weekend. Unfortunately, after these rain events, we're still in a highly urban area is where we're going to really see a lot of this. Tommy Mitchell with the San Antonio River Authority says this is an ongoing problem for the park after severe weather. A lot of this trash is really just sitting in, sitting in these storm drains, and then once we receive that rain, it just flushes it out. Mitchell says that this low water crossing can rise anywhere from 8 to 10 feet, meaning anything from old mattresses to blankets and rugs will get stuck along the tree line. We have a lot of folks that utilize this area, do a lot of recreating here, fishing, hiking, things like that. And uh, we get a lot of response from a lot of those folks going, I, I, I had no idea. And as you can see from this tree right next to me, the amount of trash that has already built up and how high above it goes water level. Now, Tommy Mitchell told us earlier that styrofoam cups and plastic bags are the things that they see the 
most out here after heavy rain. And with more rainy days ahead, the River Authority is asking people to be mindful of littering and not taking trash out earlier than their pickup date because chances are, once it blows away or gets onto the streets, it will end up here. Last year we had about 100,000 pounds of loose litter that was removed from this area. The River Authority is highly concerned and visibly and aware of the water quality here. We want to protect its ecosystem. RJ Marcus, KSAT 12 News. Trash cans. Yeah. Use them. Point is, you got to dispose of it properly, not the mm. rain's fault. Right? Yeah, it's a, don't blame the storms for yeah. it, right? It, the trash has to be moved by the storm, but it's not in a trash can, obviously. It's not trash cans mm -hmm. getting carried away. Yeah. All right, anyway, let's talk about it. We have more storms on the way, and the storm chances return on Thursday. Take a look at our chances there, and it's about a 40% on Thursday, and then daily pop up afternoon storms and even evening storms thereafter. So starting on Thursday, we've got daily storm chances. It's a very spring-like weather pattern we're getting into with the southwesterly flow aloft that's going to give us some energy to help kickstart some showers and storms. Just right now it doesn't look like anything very widespread. Today it's all out in West Texas, parts of New Mexico, and even northern Mexico. I showed you some of the blow off clouds earlier that are making it to Del Rio. You've got that cloud deck overhead because of those high clouds streaming from one of the storms. I don't think any of them will make it to the Rio Grande this afternoon and evening, but it'll be a different story in the days ahead. Now one factor that we have is this big counterclockwise circulation over Northern California. Well, it's centered over Northern California, but it's a broad circulation that stretches well out into the Pacific as well. And this upper level low, due to its proximity to us and that counterclockwise circulation around it, is providing some upper level energy. And this is, this is what we often refer to as a dirty flow aloft because it's just messy. It's got these little impulses of upper energy that are mixed in with it, coming and going, and sometimes they're very difficult to time out. And so that's why it's that isolated activity, nothing too widespread, and it often has to coincide with the good daytime heating and instability to help us break the cap. But we're getting into this pattern and it's here to stay. So let's fast forward to Thursday. This is one computer model that paints this picture doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen. And honestly, I think it's going to probably be a little different than what you see here. But the point being in this kind of weather pattern, we often see the storms develop along or west of the border in Mexico or right along the Rio Grande, and then they track eastward and sometimes they can even make it to San Antonio. So that's going to be the general trend we're looking at in the days ahead, looking off to the west in the afternoon and evening, seeing what can develop. And then if something does develop, how far east it makes it. This computer model does hint at uh, San Antonio getting clipped by this storm by Thursday evening and Thursday night. It's a possibility right now. I don't think the exact location is going to be right, though, with that computer model. All right, here's a look at the severe weather risk. Isolated to scattered severe weather expected across most of our area, especially along and west of I-35. So we, whatever develops in the days ahead, can quickly become strong to severe. It's that time of year with our atmosphere. 79 degrees right now, dew point is 64. Southeasterly wind at nine, that's reinforcing the humidity that we have in place. It's not oppressive, but we definitely notice that mugginess. That's gonna lead to some areas of fog tomorrow morning and low clouds every day through the extended forecast. No break in the humidity. Actually, it gets even thicker by Friday into the weekend with deweys back in the 70s then. Across the state, mixtures, mixture of 70s and 80s, 80 in Hondo, 78 Bulverde. Converse right now at 79 along with New Braunfels. Tomorrow morning, we start the day at 64. By the afternoon, we make it into the 80s. I think 84 degrees, the high temperature becoming partly cloudy once we shake free from those low morning clouds. And then 90 degrees is back by this upcoming weekend. And that's a humid 90, so get ready. <laughs> All right, thank you, Adam. Getting the call that you're going to the NFL and being drafted is always an exciting thing. Absolutely. You know, it's fun to watch these young men get drafted. They hug their mom, their dad, their family, their friends. Then they go up on the stage and they hug the commission. It's also cool to see the phone calls when they call these guys. Like, for example, the Texans calling C.J. Stroud. Such an awesome moment. And LeBron James, you know what? He still thinks about the San Antonio Spurs. Coming up. 
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Getting selected in the NFL draft is a dream come true for so many football players. Houston Texans quarterback C.J. Stroud is now living that goal as the second overall selection in the 2023 NFL draft. He is one of 259 players who heard their names called during the three-day draft process. It started with QB Bryce Young, who was selected first overall by Carolina, and ended with Deshaun Johnson at pick 259, who's now a member of the LA Rams. Some of the coolest video from draft night is the phone call involving teams and the players they selected. Here's that phone call with the Texans and Stroud. What's happening, brother? How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm feeling a lot better now. <laughs> Welcome to Texas, bud. Yes, Excited to have thank you. you. Thank you. No, I look forward to working thank with you. D'Amico is going to get on the phone here in a little bit. He'll visit with you here, and then we'll catch up with you after. But congratulations, you've earned this opportunity, yes, and you know we can't wait to get started with you. Thank you for the opportunity, man. I promise I won't let you down. I'm going to work my tail off. You got it. CJ, what's up, my man? What's up, coach? Hey, man. Hey, we're we're all fired up, man. Excited, right? Can't wait to get to work with you, man. You ready? You ready to go? Ready yes. to compete? Yes, sir. Yeah, just like we talked about, man. That's all I'm about. Yes, sir. I appreciate the opportunity. You know it, man. Let's go do work. With two of the top three picks in the NFL draft in Stroud and Will Anderson Jr., the Texans have a whopping $105,910,000 total rookie allocation for signing their 2023 draft class per multiple reports. They're the only team to top 100 mil. Denver beat Phoenix 97-87 last night in Game 2 of the Western Conference semifinals, taking a 2-0 series lead. Nuggets big man Nikola Jokic led the way with 39 points and 16 rebounds. The Suns were up 73-70 after 3. Then they got outscored 27-14 in the fourth quarter, shooting 7 for 25 in that final frame. Suns point guard Chris Paul left the game in the third quarter with growing tightness, and he did not return. He certainly makes that team run. Here's Devin Booker on CP3 after the game. It's an unfortunate event, obviously. Um, I mean, I don't know what it is yet. You know, I haven't really got to talk to him, but you know, all we can do is hope he, you know, has a speedy recovery. Um, we're going to be behind him. We're going to hold it down while he's out um, or if he's out, and we'll just take it from there. Paul has some time to rest up because game three is Friday night at 9 in Phoenix. The seventh seeded Los Angeles Lakers will play the sixth seed Golden State Warriors tonight in game one of that Western Conference semifinal. Golden State upset number three Sacramento in the first round, needing seven games to advance. The Lakers needed six games to beat a number two Memphis, and here we are. LeBron James says the Warriors remind him of the Spurs when they were winning NBA titles in 2007 and 2014, beating James in both of those years to win it all. And you got to be super duper locked in. Um, you can't make a mistake. You just can't. You can't make a mistake. They make you pay. It's, it's literally that simple. Um, you know, it's some, it's some teams I've played in my career that's um, that's had that 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 notion on you, and, and they're one of them. They're right there at the top. You know, along with some of those great San Antonio Spurs teams, where you just if you make a mistake, they make you pay, and it's that simple. So we have to be locked in. James will never forget those great Spurs teams, right? Game one between the Lakers and Warriors is tonight at 9. And former New Braunfels uh, pitcher Bryce Miller will make his MLB debut tonight for the Seattle Mariners. He was called up today and will face the Oakland A's tonight at the Oakland Coliseum. And the Mariners say this is not a one-game call-up either, so we wish him the very best. I love that the Spurs live rent-free in LeBron's head. <laughs> yeah. I think we all do. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Our KSAB Q&A is up next. The month of May is already here, which means the end of school is right around the corner, and so is the summer sun. Today we have Dr. Robert Gilson with San An or UT Health San Antonio joining us to talk about all the things we need to know when it comes to skin cancer, especially warning signs and some myths mm -hmm. that are out there. Dr. Gilson, thanks for being here. I, I want to start you. with those warning signs. What are the things that we all need to pay attention to? Okay, so first of all, um, one in five of us does get skin cancer, so it is fairly common. So people do need to look at their skin and be aware of what to watch for. The three most common ones are basal cell skin cancer. And I tell people on that one, if you have an area that crusts, bleeds, and just doesn't heal, that's the sign for that. Uh, for squamous cell, those are often red, crusted bumps that occur on the face, back of the ears, sun exposed areas, back of the hands especially if you've been outdoors, like our cowboys, our ranchers, 
uh, golfers, tennis players, uh, um, lifeguards, etc. Now, melanoma is the one that can kill you. And so we want people to recognize that one in 30 of us will now get that. It's on an epidemic. We like to detect it early before it spreads because it can be lethal. And indeed, it's the leading cause of death in young people from 20 to 29. So the things we look at there are asymmetry. So the ABCDs, asymmetry, one side doesn't look like the other. B, borders irregular or notched, not evenly round. C, color. So black, white, red, brown, you know, patriotic moles are not good if they're different colors. Diameter, usually over the size of a, a pencil eraser or evolving. So if someone tells me it's changing, uh, that's always a red flag. So those are the things to watch out for. And at what point would you see something that you want to go see a doctor like yourself and, and get this checked out? You know, I encourage everyone who's at risk to get a, a skin exam. If you've ever had a precancer or skin cancer, you do need to get seen yearly. If you're immunocompromised or on immune medicines as a transplant patient or autoimmune disease, same thing. But other risk factors, if you have fair skin, you know, maybe redhead, blonde, you don't really tan, you just freckle or you burn easily, uh, you've been out in the sun a lot. Um, those are other things that put you at risk. Certainly, if you've been in a tanning booth, you're at risk for all three types of skin cancer. Um, and if you have a family history, someone who's had melanoma or other skin cancer, I would encourage you to, to look at your skin. And if something just doesn't seem right, you see a mole or your wife sees a mole at, that just stands out. We call it the ugly duckling sign. Uh, do you see a, a board certified dermatologist? We'll be happy to do the screening and hopefully reassure you it's okay, or if not, detect things when they're early and curable. Let's talk about some of the myths that we want to bust here this evening. One of them being that people with darker skin tone don't get skin cancer. Yeah, that is a myth. Um, so we do see uh, skin cancer in skin of color. You know, San Antonio is a diverse population. I do see it in skin of color. African Americans get melanoma in unusual sites like the nails the uh, palms and soles, so we always look there. And uh, Hispanics get a lot of pigmented basal cells as well. And so it can occur in all types of skin of color as well. Now, another myth that only older people get skin cancer. Yeah, that is another myth. So we see skin cancer, younger and younger age, especially melanoma. It's the leading cause of cancer death in our youth. And so um, don't think that just because you're young, you're immune. Um, we're certainly seeing that. And if you have a doubt, get it examined. If we detect it early, it can be cured. So no one is immune from skin cancer. Of course, it does increase as we do get older, uh, but it can occur in the young as well. So here's maybe the most popular myth out there that you don't need to wear sunscreen when it's in the winter time or when it's cloudy outside. Yes, that is another myth. So always wear sunscreen. Cloudy days, the ultraviolet rays still get through the clouds. And so you, you know you can still burn when you're out there. So we encourage uh, sunscreens. Um, I like an SPF of 30 or greater, broad spectrum, UVA and UVB. Don't forget to re reapply after every two hours because it isn't waterproof. They only say it's water resistant. Wide brim hats are good. And I like the sun protective clothing because you don't have to reapply it and it doesn't expire like sunscreens. Protection is key. Yeah. How about before we go, treatment for skin cancer? What does that look like? Yeah. So for most skin cancers, we can do a simple excision uh, with a, a margin and, and leave a, a small scar in place of the skin cancer. For higher risk skin cancers, we have uh, most surgery who can do that with a narrow margin, like if it's on the nose or the ear. So that's tissue sparing. Um, occasionally, we'll do topical chemotherapy or what I call a scrape and burn or electrodesiccation curatage for superficials. And then for non-surgical candidates, there are some chemotherapies as well as radiation. Uh, but far and away, usually it's an excision that will remove and cure a skin cancer. Dr. Robert Gilson, UT Health San Antonio, thanks for being here. Things we all need to remember, especially in the coming months. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, doctor. We'll be right back.